start with this. How can you tell a good wine from an average wine? By uh, the price. Welcome to episode 17 of the Totally Free Colombo podcast, where you get exactly what you pay for. Yeah, we're nothing if not value for money. That's true. Do you think we're a, a cheap wine or a, an expensive champagne? It's probably somewhere in the middle. You think? Yeah, I would say so. We're not. We're certainly not that wine you get in a plastic bottle at the supermarket with a screw cap. <laughs> okay. How have you been, Ian? Not too bad. It's been an interesting week. I'm glad you are. I've got a slightly delicate head today. Oh dear. I don't think it's appropriate to watch any old port in a storm without a glass of red wine in hand. Well, it would have been a good idea. I didn't have any. I would have absolutely subscribed to that. I've often fancied actually recording the podcast with a a drink or two. It'd be, quite, it'd be quite interesting, but your drive home would be a bit of a illegal. challenge. Yeah, yeah, it would be highly illegal. The amount of nonsense we talk anyway, I'm not sure if it would be improved by a... A cheap wine. I do think there'd be a problem because when you've had a drink, everything seems hilarious. It does. But the people listening to the podcast generally are going to be sober. And you know, if you're the sober person on a night out, nobody's quite as funny as they think they are. That's true. You're certainly not. No, I, I'm not funny at the best of times. <laughs> We've got a classic episode this week, Ian. So perhaps you can give us this week's summary. Any old port in a storm sees Columbo edged out of his comfort zone as he must both educate his palate and resort to grand theft to catch a killer whose confidence grows as the episode progresses. Adrian Carcini is a master vinter whose passion for his craft is his sole motivation, much to the chagrin of his younger half-brother Rick. Thanks to a will that divided their father's movable and heritable assets, Adrian has lived with the benefit of a large bank balance, but no need to make more money. Rick, on the other hand, is cash poor, but owns the family vineyard. On the eve of his latest marriage, Rick advises Adrian that he is selling the vineyard, leading to his big brother's brutal and ultimately fatal response. Although evidence suggests Adrian was not in town when Rick died, Columbo has a nose for the inconsistencies in his story, and when the heat is turned up, there can only be one outcome. A vintage summary, Ian. Now, we like last week, I think we should make a rule that there will be no wordplay on the uh, the wine industry. A little bit late. Yeah. Okay, from now on, nothing else. Okay, can we do Star Trek wordplay this week then? Yeah, sure. Okay. We start this week... um, Well, before we start... It's a 96 minute episode. It's one of the longer ones. You didn't feel it watching it. It went quite it, nicely. It, I'm glad you said that because it didn't feel, it didn't feel padded. I thought the episode was given the room to breathe. Uh, so. <laughs> oh goodness. I thought it worked well. Yeah, definitely a good episode. One of the, the better ones that we've seen, I would say. I think the second half. Went quicker than the first half, but mm-hmm. the whole episode was really good. It was. Tight episode, good performances. We have an establishing exterior shot of the Carcini winery. And we, we have the immediate credits this week. Yep. Um, I think we've mentioned before that seems to be the norm now. And we see four men toasting a, a great variety and enjoying its produce. It's very stuffy. It's kind of a formal gathering. They're holding their wine glasses by the base. It's... Yeah, definitely a, a group of people who are serious about wine, I would say. We see Adrian Carcini, who we assume is the... Proprietor, it's pro- Carcini Wines, mm-hmm. yeah. And there are three other businessmen with him. He's obviously very passionate about his wine. He is probably more passionate about wine than, than business. Certainly the impression you get is that the wine is the most important thing here. Um... Mm-hmm. Very stuffy, very formal, like I said. It's all... I want to make an analogy to a movie, but it's so obscure that I don't think anyone will have seen it. Let's just leave it then. Okay. But yeah, we learn that he is passionate about the wine because the other three ask if he intends selling this. And he states that he would rather just enjoy it himself. Yes, he doesn't seem to be a hard-nosed businessman. 
Kirstina excuses himself. Yes, he tells the others to treat themselves to a slice of cheese. cheese. Yes, and he goes to his office in order to get a, a fine claret. That's right. And the three remaining men are obviously impressed with him, and he listens in on his secretary's intercom uh, as they agree to bestow some sort of award on him. Yes. And we go to Kirstini's main office, and he is pleased with what he's heard in this intercom, and he enters... His office is feeling upbeat, he's quite happy, and there's somebody waiting to speak to him. It's his younger playboy-esque brother. His half-brother. Half-brother, yes. Enrique. Enrico. Enrico, right. Giuseppe Enrico Garcini. Something like that. And he is asking for cash for an airfare. Yes, he's flying out to, I think, Mexico to get married. Uh, Acapulco. Okay. Yeah, it's his fourth wedding, I think we come to Yeah, I think there's a bit of an exchange between the two of them and it's established that He's not, he's not interested in the quality of the wine, he just wants his money to go off and get yeah. married. Carcini Senior, or Carcini the Elder, is not interested in, uh, or doesn't respect his younger half-brother's lifestyle. That's right. He thinks it's frivolous and childish. Yep, and I'm I'm concerned too that the, the younger man's going to murder his brother to get the money for his airfare and whatever else he needs. Mm-hmm. And what we discover here is that their father left Adrian, that's the, the older brother, he left him the uh, cash when he died, but Enrico, or Rick, was left the winery and the land. And the vineyard, yes. And it looks like Adrian has run this business into the ground. It's not making a, it's not turning a profit. He's more interested in, in the yeah, wine they're, they're producing good quality wine, mm-hmm. but they're not making a lot of money. And Adrian then describes Rick's mother in very unflattering terms. True. I think, yes, he's got a little bit of a um, fascination or obsession with class and breeding. <laughs> the way he, he talks about it here, yeah, it's not very uh, becoming. But anyway, Adrian decides to give Rick some cash for the airfare. And after he'd received this cash, he lets it be known that his cash flow issue at the moment is temporary. Oh yeah, he drops a bombshell on Adrian. Massive bombshell. What does he? What does he tell him? He's selling the vineyard to the Moreno brothers, who I assume is a mass market wine producer, like maybe the the Gallo brothers are um, for us. Interesting that you should mention that. Ian. this episode was filmed at the Marazu Winery in San Jose, and the Marazu Winery was founded by two brothers in the eighteen hundreds, and eventually. It was sold to the Gallo Company. That's very interesting. That's life imitating art. It is. And I think we have a clip here which reveals... How Adrian feels about it, yeah. Yeah. Selling the land. What? The Marino brothers have made me an offer. And I'm accepting it. Marino brothers... The Marino Brothers. The Marino Brothers! Sixty-nine cents a gallon, Marino Brothers. They don't make wine. They don't even make good mouthwash. But they make money, huh? I mean, you snobs can drink your wine, but I... I, sorry. <laughs> I, think, I think it's safe to say that Adrian would not be a, a consumer of that gallo wine. No, no. He was around today. He's clearly a, a connoisseur and a passionate man. And he doesn't just shout about it. He takes action. The action itself, I think, um, the reason why he was so enraged, or one of the final reasons was that his brother patronised him. He's basically taunting him, isn't he? He was, by saying that, uh, not to worry, I'm sure the Marino brothers will keep him on in a capacity of chief label liquor. Yes. <laughs> he really is just trying to insult him there. And at this, he loses his temper, doesn't he? Well, he gets told there's nothing he can do about it, and he, mm. he reasons that, yes, there is something he can do about it. And what does he do? He grabs a nearby object. I couldn't see what it was, a vase or a, It, it wasn't think, clear. No. And strikes his brother over the head. He doesn't kill him, but he knocks him out. Yeah, this is a, an interesting killing or murder. Normally, the victim is dead immediately or 
very very soon. Yeah. This, especially since it was a a relative, uh, a, bro- a half brother. Yeah. It's a very cold and horrible way to to kill someone. Yeah. It's not apparent whether he thinks Rick is dead at this point or not. Well, I think he he knows he's not because he does. See, we do see him move and, and yeah. groan. But still, Adrian seems a little bit shaken, yeah. shall we say. However, he composes himself and returns back to the outer office, the secretary's office. Yes, he speaks to Karen, his yes. secretary. She has turned up to complete or pick up some documentation or paperwork for the forthcoming trip to New York that they're about to have. Yep, and she refers to having seen Rick's car outside. Adrian obviously wants to get rid of her. He's nervous. And yeah. He dismisses her, tells her to go home, pack for the the, the trip. It's, yeah, it's being extended to a week. Do you see that at this point, or perhaps that's later? But anyway, he, yeah, he gets her to leave. And he goes back in to check on his brother, and he's still not dead. You can we still see him move or, or breathe or sigh Yeah, heavily. I'm not sure. I mean, Adrian's obviously hit him over the head trying to kill him because that's how he's going to get his way. Mm-hmm. But it's not clear now what his plan is. Is he waiting for him to die, or is he going to. Yeah. Reconsider. Sure, and the thing that got me here was that this award probably meant the world to Adrian. He's the man of the year in his industry. Yeah, and this is his life's work. He's Mm -hmm. worked towards producing fantastic wine. But yet he was willing to leave his brother not dead in the office as he goes back to to speak to the awards board. Yeah. What if he got up and come through and they found out that he had just attempted to murder him? That that award would obviously be, I'd assume, would be retracted. Well, who knows? It's it's an unusual situation anyway. Mm-hmm. Nonetheless, he leaves him and returns to the main room where the three other men were, were yeah. drinking. And his composure wobbles a little bit because he can't keep his hands steady enough to decant the ex- very expensive wine. So he invites the chap called Falcon yes. to decant it for him and he's obviously very honoured and taken aback by this offer. Yes. And they explain that they are going to name Corsini Man of the Year and he's very excited about this. He is. He then sees off the guests and returns inside to drag Rick into his boat. Oh, but before that, he says to them that he can't wait to tell his brother about the award and makes the point to them that the brother owns the vineyard. And I'm wondering, is he setting something up here? Why is he doing this? But He's obviously worried about what he has just done. In the back of his mind, he must be thinking yeah. about, I need to try and cover my tracks here. I need to yeah. make it look as if he's not here. I mentioned in the summary that he grows with confidence as the episode goes on. I think we see him at his most rattled here. He's just struck his brother over the head. He's lost his temper. He couldn't hold the wine. He's making up stories. He hasn't got a plan yet. Mm-hmm. And I think we almost see the plan developing. And I like that in this episode mm-hmm. because often you see in the Columbo episodes, the killer, whether it's a heat of the moment situation or whatever it is, they kill somebody. And then within seconds, they, they, a, a they have a plan channel. and they know exactly what they're going to do. Mm-hmm. And they, they stick to that plan. Whereas Corsini, almost, he's almost winging it for quite a large part of the episode. It's a more realistic portrayal of what, how you might react should yeah. you be in that situation yourself. And it's a more realistic killing, I think. It's somebody in a heat, you know, heat of the moment has struck someone. Yeah. It happens fairly regularly. Yeah, and I think it's perhaps not an issue that he hasn't died immediately because Adrian's clearly not as physically capable as his younger brother. Mm. He's not a strong man by the looks of him. He's much shorter, so he's reaching up to mm-hmm. strike the brother. So it's probably not odd that it wasn't a killing blow. Mm-hmm. That's actually a fair point, which I will mention later. The physical difference yeah. is something that's a slight niggle with me, but okay. we can chat about that. Yeah, As we say, he sees off the guests and he returns inside and he drags Rick into his... He's got a private wine cellar for his yeah. own wines. So this isn't the commercial... Area. No, this is, it's almost like a secret entrance. He kind of bumps into a, a shelf or a door mm-hmm. that opens up. And we again notice that Rick is still alive. And Kersini ties him up and then turns off the air conditioning. Within. Right. And the humidifier as well, we mm-hmm. find later. He's turned them both off. Before locking him in. Yes. He then 
takes Rick's Ferrari and he hides it in his own garage. Yep. Out of sight. And he notices the scuba gear in the boot or the trunk. So perhaps this is the first moment where his plan becomes more formed. Or it begins to take shape to a certain mm. extent. He's, he's at least got an idea at this point. From there we go to an airplane. Yeah, I thought before we go there, it was interesting to note the number plate on Adrian's car was Carcini. Okay. So obviously quite a proud man. Bit of an ego. Yeah, whereas Rick, the playboy, mm. didn't have a personalised number plate. It sure. was just a regular number plate. Well spotted. Yeah. So yeah, we're on this plane to New York. <laughs> I thought the first image was hilarious. You've yeah. got these three guys from the wine club huddled around a girl playing a piano on an, the plane. An organ, I think it was. Right. I noticed that, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so listener question here. Perhaps this was something that you might find on a first class flight back in the seventies. You certainly you wouldn't find it today. I'm not no, sure. But I'm guessing it it wouldn't have been totally outrageous or else why would it have been the show? Sure. I just thought their facial expressions were hilarious the way they were kinda of just kinda of <laughs> leering over her a little bit and taking a, <laughs> an exaggerated interest in the the playing. Yeah. Uh Carcini is seated with Karen, his yeah, secretary. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. And he asks her to send a letter to Rick. Yeah, he dictates a letter. In Acapulco, informing him of his award. Yeah, she asks, does he maybe not just want to send a telegram? But he, he insists that he does not. He hates telegrams. He mm-hmm. hates sending them. He hates receiving them because they imply tragedy. I can understand that. It's a, a nice... It's a nice sort of nod within the episode here, but I think telegrams have generally been their sort of emergency communication. Yeah, but I think also this is around Vietnam time, mm-hmm. so people would be getting telegrams telling them about sons being killed. Yeah, so perhaps there's that connection as mm-hmm. well. He also asks her to write a check for five thousand dollars as a wedding gift. Yeah, she considers that very generous. It would be. We've had this discussion. That's six months' salary <laughs> for Colombo. <laughs> We then go to the wine auction in yes, New York. Yes. And Carcini is being charming and and quite funny actually. Yep, yep, yep. And spending a lot of money. A, a vast amount of cash. He's already spent eighteen thousand dollars by the time his favourite lot comes up. And that that eighteen thousand dollar was on uh for cases of wine. Yes. Not individual bottles. No, no, no. But this time he just before we talk about this. The one thing I loved was his Austin Power style cuffs. I don't know if you noticed that. I didn't. Okay, they were they were fabulous. Have a look out for them. They were very uh, as extravagant as his <laughs> wine purchases. He looks like he could be a Bond villain, doesn't he? Don't, Ian. We'll get to we'll <laughs> get to that later. Don't jump the gun. <sighs> yes, he um, he's bidding in the auction here. He's in a bidding war. He is with one of the other guys from the club. Was it? Yeah, it was the fellow with the, the moustache okay. and the little goatee beard. And there was a, a really nice line. Do you want to tell us what it was? Yeah, uh, Karen asks him if he really needs this bottle of wine at this price and he tells her, uh, Karen, nobody really needs a $5,000 bottle of wine. He just doesn't want anybody else to have it. Very honest. It's Yes, it is. And, and nobody else will have it because that's the winning bid. Mm-hmm. We leave the wine auction and... We head to the LAPD headquarters. I think this is the first time we see Columbo at work. It is the first time. And this is something that, it was a rule. So there was a set of rules put in place by Lincoln Levison, right. the, the creators. Not, not you know, rules in the sense that they could not be broken, but a guideline, a structure. Yeah, sure. So Columbo would never be seen with a, a gun. Yeah. He would never, his wife would never be seen. Okay. He would never be seen at home. And the other one was that he was always, or he, he was never seen in the office. They didn't want that. It wasn't that type of police show where you would see other other cops and there'd be typewriters and okay. all that type of stuff. So they changed that in this episode. I, I don't think it done, you know, I don't think it was out of place. It didn't do, didn't do any yeah, harm. Yeah, I mean, it didn't have to be Columbo that was there, but it, mm-hmm. it worked fine for the story, I think. And it was interesting that he's at work at 2am, showing that even though he is the the star of the department, he mm-hmm. still gets the night shift sometimes. Columbo puts the hours in. It also perhaps explains the episode a couple of weeks ago where he showed up at 10pm shattered. Perhaps he'd been working shifts and that was why. Quite possibly. We see a woman asking for his help over 
her missing fiancé. Yeah, when we're 20 minutes into the episode at this point and it's her first sight of Columbo, which reminded me a lot of Murder by the Book, mm-hmm. where you got a good setup. Yep. And again, this episode does that really well. And I think this is probably the first episode since then that does it quite as well. Yeah. Uh, where you get a good meaty setup at the start and you understand it lays, what's happening. Yeah, it lays out the plot, the characters. You just, Yeah, it's a, a fantastic yeah, the foundation. The pieces are put in place. Yeah. Unlike some other episode recently where you're, you're trying to work out as it progresses. Yeah. And in fact, in some cases, Columbo is a, ahead of us, the viewer. Sure. And this one, you were back to the, the formula that works best, I think. So Columbo is initially saying that he can't help her. He's a homicide detective and that you know, he needs to go to, she needs to go to uh, missing persons. Yeah, I found this exchange hilarious because he essentially implies there's nothing he can do until a body is found, mm. which is not what we've seen. Yeah. There's been a number of episodes where he's shown up before a body's been found. Yeah. In fairness, I think in, in those episodes there have been an explanation. You know, that was a, a fr- that you know, someday it was a, a friend of the chief of police asked him sure. to investigate or or in the case of the Greenhouse Jungle, it would have been uh, prudent for a homicide cop to be there, I suppose, based on the likelihood of the kidnapped victim not returning alive. Sure. But he finds out that the missing fiancé is Italian. Yes, he says that we Italians need to stick together. But then he sees a photo of the man, he doesn't think he looks very Italian at all. No. Uh, but he finds out he is from uh, Milan up north. in the north and <laughs> they make them fear her up there. Yeah. He's going to take the case, essentially. <laughs> I think he's fed up sitting around the office. Well, before he takes the case, he finds out that they were due to be married. Yes. And he asks her, you know, he says it's not uncommon for someone to get cold feet. Sure. And she tells him he's been married three times already. So he suggests that his feet were probably warm enough. <laughs> warm enough by now, yeah. At that point. He also is told by her that the last she heard of him, he was scuba diving and then going to the winery. To visit his brother on yeah. the Sunday afternoon. Yeah, so Columbo decides he's going to get involved. Now, what you mentioned there was that he looked at the photo, the photo of him and said that he was a good-looking man. Yeah. And he can't blame her for being worried. So that reminded me of a in Black, right. where he looked at the victim and he was impressed by their their, their looks. But sure. it's also, you know, it's a, it's like a, it, he said that he can't blame her for being worried. He understands why she's worried, as if to imply that, well, if, you're, if your fiancé was ugly, then you probably wouldn't be that worried about him. Yeah, you'd expect him back. <laughs> we move from there to the return journey on the airplane. There's definitely some tension here between Karen and Adrian. Mm-hmm. Adrian Carsini is cradling his five thousand dollar bottle of wine on his, <laughs> his on his lap. lap. Yeah. I don't think you would get away with carrying that on your lap these days. It need to be in the uh, the hold above you. Sure, or in a much more secure packaging. Mm-hmm. And he is asked if he'll open this up, but he said it's uh, some wines are made for drinking, but this wine in particular is made for buying and selling. Yeah, it'll probably be worth more in five or ten years. Which is odd because we found or discovered before that he's more of a... He likes to drink this wine rather than thinking about it as an investment. Yeah, I almost thought... I mean, I know that you don't agree with this, but I almost thought at that auction, when that bottle of wine came up, that he acted a bit more recklessly than he would because of the circumstances. Because the crime's been committed. Not because he thinks he's going to get caught necessarily, Mm -hmm. but maybe there's just kind of an adrenaline or there's a... Oh, I, I would agree with that. Right. I I don't agree that he anticipated that he would shortly be locked up, therefore he was splashing the cash, because if that was the case, then the storyline should have had him popping the cork. Sure, yeah, but certainly I think it was perhaps a bit more of an extravagant purchase than he would ordinarily mm. have made. Oh yeah, I, I agree with that. Okay. We, we get an, another insight into the relationship between Karen and Adrian at this point. Because he asks, he informs her that his car is parked at the, the airport parking. Yeah, she's hinting for a lift home yeah. and does not he get asks, offered one. Yeah. <laughs> she says she's getting a, a, going to get a cab and is disappointed when he doesn't suggest that he drop her off. Yeah, yeah. I think, yes, a bit of um, unrequited longing mm, yes. going on there. It, he rushes back to the winery in a sort of comic haste. Yeah, and he finds Rick is now dead. Yes. But things have been disturbed because he looks quite shocked. He, 
he comes into the cellar and you see his shocked face and I think they're setting you up to think the body's not there mm. or what's happened. Yes. But it is. But I think it's just the shock of him actually now realising that he had... Okay, so what I'd mentioned before, this might make a little bit more sense, it was his brother. He hit him in a fit of rage. Yeah. But couldn't if it was a stranger, perhaps he would have finished him off. But maybe in his mind, okay, I've hit him, but I can't deliberately kill him now. And yeah. by leaving him to die, you know, he feels like he's not, you know, he, he couldn't he's bring himself. Yeah, doing it, yeah. He couldn't bring himself to, to actually. It's almost crueler though. <laughs> oh, without a doubt, this is a horrible way to die in the heat in a truss stop in a, a wine cellar somewhere. Yeah. Not even able to drink the wine that's sitting <laughs> right next to you. He puts his scuba gear on him, puts him in the car. Yeah, in his Ferrari. Yeah. And in the that, boot, yeah. yeah, and that's what trunk. I. And, yeah, yeah. No, he doesn't put him in the trunk. He puts him in the passenger seat. Does he? I thought he was in the trunk. No, I don't. Oh, no, the bike went in the trunk. Yes. That was what it was. So, I mentioned earlier, I've got a little issue with this. We have established the difference in age and physical yeah. attributes of, of the, the, the two the two people here. Do you know how hard it must be to dress, even just dress someone in scuba gear? Yeah. It's hard enough to dress yourself in, in the, the wetsuit, but to put the wetsuit on his brother and then manoeuvre him into the car that would take quite a lot of work it's obviously a dark horse immense superpowers Italian stallion <laughs> but anyway he does do that and yeah you're right he then takes a a, fold, a foldable collapsible yeah, bike, bike puts it in the trunk or the boot two, of the car yeah two points about this one why would Adrian Carcini own such a thing it's not the type he wouldn't he You'd think as an Italian he'd have a Vespa that he could yeah. put in the... <laughs> yes. Uh, but it just didn't, you know, it didn't feel like the type of item he would own. I don't know. And just a, a point of note, this is not the only time we will see a killer use the same means of leaving the crime scene with regards uh, after committing a murder involving an Italian. Fold the way. Right. Yeah. yeah. Maybe it's an Italian trope. Is this the last time we see the brother? It is. It's a shame. I thought he was quite good. Mm-hmm. The brother was played by uh, Gary Conway, born in 1936, most famously known as Captain Steve Burton in Land of the Giants. He also played Tim Tilson in Burke's Law. Okay. He was also an ex-Playgirl model All right. in his day, in 1973, I think. Or That's the same, the same year this year. was Mm-hmm. And maybe probably we got the muscle bound reference during the episode. Mm-hmm. And he went on in real life to own a winery. Oh, that's fascinating. I mm-hmm. hope it's because he liked this episode. <laughs> yeah, he leaves the uh, the winery with the bike in the, the trunk and the brother covered up in the uh, passenger seat. Yeah. And we go to a cliffside beside the beach or the sea. And yeah, he chucks him into the water. Quite a, a prodigious throw from that you know, over mm. the rocks at the bottom, and yep, a bit like last week's uh, throwing of the, the the cream, the tub of cream over the rocks. Yeah, a superhuman effort. Mm-hmm. We go back to the cliffside the next morning. Yes, uh, it's now a crime scene, and this is where Colombo arrives. Yes, and he's not smoking his cigar this time. He's not. Why not? Um, he he decided he's just going to chew them. Presumably for health reasons, or I think so. Um, but he's asked by his colleague why he's chewing such an expensive cigar, and he tells him he doesn't want to drop his standard of living. <laughs> I think that's a joke. Uh, I don't think he chews. Whether it's a joke or not, cigar. <laughs> I don't know. It's interesting. He actually um, later in the episode he's got a much longer cigar, so mm-hmm. I think maybe there's not a consistent type of cigar. There's not. The uniformed cop and Colombo fawn over this Ferrari. Yes. And I think the cop says that it would cost a year's salary. That seems quite cheap, to be honest. These days, okay, an an average cop, we've worked this out before. Yeah. But let's just talk about today's money. A Ferrari, say, what, 100k? Yeah, I think it would be at least a couple of years' salary for someone in Colombo's position. Yeah. I don't know whether that's changed or if that's just how things Mm -hmm. are. It's just kind of a, maybe it's just a, a figure of speech. A year's salary just means a lot of money. Yeah, possibly. Could be. 
We then see a fisherman. With a spectacular moustache. Yeah. He is able to ID the body as Rick Carcini. It's almost unnecessary because Columbus seen a photograph of Rick Carcini. I thought mm. they would just have him identify the body. But it may have looked at he's been in the water for what, five days? Sure. Well they do talk about his body being decomposed slightly. Yeah. A bit squidgy. Yeah, but he's not actually been in the, the water for five days though. No, he's not. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. A critical point here actually. Uh, yeah. Well, Columbo would assume no, they wouldn't even have known at that point. That yeah. Even. Well there'd be no reason for Columbo to try and identify a body, I suppose. Other than he knew that Rick had been scuba diving. Yeah, and was missing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. He does seem quite disappointed when he finds out that it is Rick Kirstini, obviously because he's he was, met Yeah, him. he was trying to help find him. Yeah. We <laughs> We then move on to a A beach party. Beach club party, yeah. The dancing, there's a man. Please, guys, go back and watch this. Um, the start of this scene. There's a fellow dancing right in the middle of the scene screen. It's, it's very disco stew from the Simpsons. Yeah. It's fantastic. It might be the best moment of dance in yeah. the history of Colombo. Some this point. brilliant uh, music as well, played in this, this portable record player. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's a it's a fantastically funny intro to the to the scene. Yeah, but Colombo comes in and he, he breaks uh, the bad news to Joan, the fiance. Yeah, she doesn't seem too caught up initially before he speaks to her. She's enjoying the party. She seems perfectly happy. And then she gets the news and she's clearly devastated. I often wondered why if she has been so distraught that she has went to Colombo to report this this uh, missing person, why she would be hanging around at a disco, at a beach party. I don't know. But it appears she has friends around her. It seemed to me like a strange group. Oh, they're a very odd bunch, aren't they? Whether they're, whether they're indulging in... Certain oh. herbal remedies, I oh, don't know. Oh, they're up to all sorts. Um, Indulging in more than just drugs, I would suggest, by the look of some of them. Who knows? It was certainly a strange group, and I, I, they had a strange sort of vibe to them. It was kind of a weird situation. A weird dynamic. Yeah. I wouldn't and she seemed to be just kind of part of this, as if she was just kind of going along with this crowd. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if uh, each of those, you know, those people that had been partners with each other at some point in the past, yeah, it was, the past it, half yeah. hour. <laughs> uh, so what we what we discover here, what Columbo tells Joan is that they understand that he died from suffocation. He apparently banged his head on some rocks. Yeah, and when his oxygen ran out, he would have suffocated. Mm-hmm. Point here, he was trussed up for a number of days by the ankles and the wrists with rope. Surely that's a dead giveaway. He would have been struggling for his life, even. A small amount of struggling would have created burns and, and marks where you've been tied up. I thought that was uh, something that would have been picked up upon, but wasn't. Yeah. And Colombo received some more information from the, the group, from the friends, Yeah. who tell him that Rick and Adrian were half-brothers, and that Rick didn't really, didn't get on well and didn't like Adrian because of his lack of business acumen. Yeah, they certainly seem to have a lot of information, these guys. Yeah. Rick himself, it's fine not to appreciate Adrian's, or to not appreciate Adrian's lack of uh, business sense. Yeah. But Rick was the same. Rick was a, 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 party, a party boy. Yeah, yeah. So why would he, it just feels odd that he doesn't like the fact that Adrian doesn't take things seriously. Sure, it's, it's unusual. The friends tell Colombo that Corsini was a bit of a wine snob or a snob in general and he ran the business effectively as a hobby. Right. And Rick wanted to sell it in order to get married. That's what he was saying earlier, yeah. And the friends also tell Colombo that Rick was a hell of an athlete. Hell of an athlete. So all this information starts Colombo down the, the path of suspicion, I think. Yeah, but I think by the next scene, he's off the case. Well, there isn't a case at this point, is there? Yeah, it's an accident. Mm-hmm. Because Colombo is now in a, a bar somewhere. Yep. And he's watching the news report on the TV. He's having a beer, not wine. <laughs> yeah. So we're identifying him as a, a beer drinker. Yeah, we don't think he's a wine drinker at all. And I think that's quite evident during the episode. I don't see Colombo as a beer drinker either. Turns out he is. In Murder by the Book, he asked for a... A bourbon from 
Sure, but in this Ken episode, Franklin. But then, yeah, you have to differentiate between what he does and what he says. I don't want to go mm-hmm. too much on what he says because he could be doing it for any number of reasons. But yeah. he does say at one point in this episode that when he got home from the hot hot picnic, he just wanted a cold beer. True. Uh, I mean, they're not uh, they're not mutually exclusive. You can enjoy a, a beer and a and a bourbon. In fact, many I people have to do. Be, honestly, say I enjoy beer, bourbon, and wine, not in one glass. But as like. do I yeah. and gin. I'm not a gin fan. Taste of flowers. Colombo is watching this news report and he is being annoyed by a drunk, a bad drunk. <laughs> That's quite amusing, actually. I quite like it. They may have done that. The news report is informing us that apparently the Rick, the victim, had died six days earlier. Yeah, it's a kind of a strange news report because the news reporter speaks like a man who has exposition to give rather mm-hmm. than a news reporter. <laughs> which obviously he is, but it's it's a very sort of weird situation. But they bring in the medical expert who says the you know the best information that they have right now is that he had um, died a few days earlier. Mm-hmm. He hit his head and then went out of oxygen, like we talked about a few minutes ago. And this stirs something within Colombo because he immediately appear, appears puzzled, and he begins to ask everyone in the pub if they knew whether or not it rained the previous Tuesday, which would have been six days ago. Yeah. No one can help him, so he phones the Weather Bureau and some newspapers, but he can't find out the answer. Because obviously this is the kind of thing we take for granted right now. It would take you or I a number of seconds, maybe less than 30, to find out what the weather was last Tuesday. Yeah. Whereas Colombo, with the full weight of the law behind him, (laughs) used to wait till the next morning. We go back to the winery, and Colombo, we see, is on a, a tour. Yeah. And he leaves to speak with the janitor, who apparently was as surprised as Colombo was that the Kersinis did not close the business that day out of a mark of respect. Yeah, I love the fact that Colombo took the tour. Um, and I thought the guy doing the tour did a good job. I, I a couple of months ago, I went on a tour of a distillery in November there, mm-hmm. and it was very similar, the way yeah. that they, they did it, the way that the guy was passionate about the product, and I thought that that was a nicely done scene. I'm glad you picked up on that. Every time I watch it, I am impressed with that performance myself. Yeah. And the janitor informs Colombo that apparently Adrian had said that Rick would have wanted them to keep working. Yeah, nobody thought that's true. No. And that's confirmed by the janitor. We then have Colombo using the, a nearby phone, and he seems satisfied to get an answer to his weather question. Yeah, and then I think he gives Joan a call. He does, but before he does that, I need to point something out here. Okay. It's probably not a big deal for you, but as Colombo fans know, this is a, a significant landmark. As he's phoning, he whistles this old man. Yes. The, the tune. Yes. This goes on to become uh, the unofficial Colombo theme tune. Okay. So this is its first appearance. Ah, uh, there you go. That's a big moment. Very big moment. I first. did. I recognise the tune mm-hmm. uh, um, fairly much immediately. Yeah. Big moment in, in, in the Colombo universe. You seem quite excited. I am. <laughs> Colombo, as you rightly said, he phones Joan, and he, after hearing this information about the weather, which we don't know what the answer is at this yeah, point. Yeah, yeah. He's asking about the car now how he felt about it. And she sort of half-jokingly says that, you know, sometimes she thought he loved it more than more than her. Yeah. So it was obviously a prized possession. We head back off to Carcini's office. Yeah, it's a strange scene. We kind of jump around a wee bit here, but... Mm. Well, this Co- is a... Well, yeah. So on you, on you go, Ian. Yeah, Colombo talks to Karen. He wants to speak to Carcini. Mm-hmm. And... He doesn't explain very clearly who he is at first. He's a bit sarcastic with her. Uh, it's, it's weird. Um, it's almost as if he's trying to flirt with her, but he doesn't know how to flirt. She asks who he is, and he won't reveal his identity immediately, yeah. and says, you know, why do you want my name? What's your name? You know, if you, that's such a beautiful name, why would you want anyone else's? It's, it's a bit weird. It's yeah. a bit awkward. And... Well, he, he does apologise for it later, but I'm not sure... What he was doing. What he was doing at all. I wonder if it's an improvised scene, it just didn't go well. Mm. Yeah, that, that could be the case, I think. 
it was almost like a really sort of shabby James Bond with yeah. money penny. Yeah. It didn't work. He eventually tells her who he is and she tells him that Kersini is not in mourning. In fact, he's in the lab. Yes. So we go to the lab and Colombo approaches Kersini who assumes he is there for a job. Yeah, strangely. Why would you think that? It doesn't look know. like either a someone who would be front of house or a wine buff or a lab technician. I don't know. It's an odd one. Mm-hmm. Colombo IDs himself and they return to his office. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's a very short scene in the lab. Mm-hmm. In the office, Carcini pours them each a, a glass of wine. And, and he objects to Colombo smoking his cigar. Rightly so. Yeah. And Colombo, uh, sorry, Carcini is quite bemused that Colombo doesn't know about wine and that he can't sing. I thought this was really interesting because quite often in these episodes of Colombo, he does have a lot of knowledge about obscure or unlikely things that you'd think, mm-hmm. well, how come he just knows about that? He just happens to know about that when there's been a murder involved. But in this episode, he clearly doesn't know about Wayne. But I think what he has... And, okay, so and some of the other episodes, the one that stands out for me was in Death Lends a Hand, where he knows about the... Palmistry. Palmistry. And I think... What that was going to be fake, though. Yes. So he knew he wanted to look at the that uh, Bremer's hand. So he... He swatted up on, yeah. on on that so that to give him the opportunity. And in this episode, at the moment, he doesn't know he needs that knowledge. But we do see that after he understands that he will be working in this environment, we do see his method. Yeah. So he goes and he, he, he does a crash course. Sure. It wasn't so much Death Lens a Hand that I was thinking of, though. More last week, lovely but lethal, you knew all about the cosmetics and about that brand. Mm-hmm. We saw in the most crucial game, you knew all about the sport. Yeah, and about the team, and there's, there's there's others I think before that where he has this instinctive knowledge that seems unlikely, but I just thought it was nice that they showed here that he doesn't always have that. That was mm-hmm. in this case he he doesn't know anything about wine, he doesn't pretend to know anything about wine, he just has to kind of roll with it at this point. Colombo is sort of taken aback at Carcini's lack of surprise at Rick's death. Yeah, we have a, a clip here. This explains it quite clearly. What exactly do you want of me? Well, sir, I imagine you must be pretty shook up by your brother's death. Not at all. I don't understand. I'm amazed he lived as long as he did. But he was such a young man, he was in such good condition. Rick took too many chances. Auto racing, skydiving, all this underwater rubbish. Of course, I'm saddened by his death. One doesn't lose a brother and remain uh, emotionless. Uh, I I have to take solace from the fact that he had such a happy life. It wasn't the sort of life I'd choose for myself, but it was good for him. I thought that was a really smart approach because what it allows him to do uh, he doesn't have to act bereaved throughout the rest of the episode or when he is with Columbo or anyone else. Yeah, so but he, he goes from being very smart there to immediately being very stupid and answering all of Columbo's questions. Yes, we, we can we can chat about that. Carcini explains the purpose of decanting wine to Columbo. That's what he's doing at, at yeah, Columbo yeah. Enters. And he explains the importance and he doesn't allow anyone else to do that. It's the one job he handles himself yes. on all this, occasions. This is his first big mistake, I think. It's a real mistake. Well, he's obviously forgotten that he got Falcon to do it mm-hmm. in the previous um, encounter. And Columbo then asks him when he last saw Rick. And Adrian asks Karen to pop through and confirm that it was the Sunday. Yeah, Columbo's indicated that his understanding is that Adrian was the last person to see mm-hmm. Rick. And Adrian says, well, it can't have been me unless he went into hiding for two days. Sure. So, uh, Carcini feels quite happy with himself. I think he's got a bit of a grin on. Yeah, this is almost like the the alibi he's set up and it's not being rumbled at this point, so he's quite content. Now, yeah, what you you mentioned earlier there, however, Carcini, he falls into the trap of trying to offer an explanation when he doesn't have to. So, Colombo's got asks him why... No one noticed the Ferrari parked for apparently five days. Yeah. And what does he say to that? 
he says it's a remote spot and maybe he just didn't see it. Unlikely. Yeah, it and why be. would you have to say anything? I don't know. Yeah. I was in New York. Mm-hmm. Why are you asking me? But and then it gets worse. Oh, he really drops himself mm-hmm. right in it with Colombo here. What Colombo has determined is that it was raining on the day when Rick was meant to have drowned. Yes. And he asks Carcini why he thinks Rick would have left his uh, the the roof of his beloved Ferrari down when he went uh, scuba diving. Yeah. Because that was how it was found. And rather than saying, I don't know, I have no idea, what does he do? He comes up with a brain theory that makes no sense. Which was? If it was down but not fastened, the wind could have caught it and blown it up and back and open. Mm-hmm. Trying far too hard, isn't he? Yeah, he doesn't need to answer this. And rather than the actual answer being a key point, it's the fact that he feels he has to give an answer that's the pointer for Columbo. Mm-hmm. I really do like this scene and the performance by Donald Pleasance throughout the entire episode. Donald Pleasance needs no introduction. Sure. Um, he died in 1995, aged 75, most famous for playing Dr. Loomis in the Halloween movies. He was also Blythe in The Great Escape, and he was, as you alluded to earlier, he played Blofeld in You Only Live Twice, the James Bond movie. Classic. What did you think of his performance? I enjoyed his performance, and I think it was good. He wasn't really your typical Killer. I mean, like I said at the start, I thought maybe the younger guy was going to kill the older mm-hmm. guy, but the fact that it was the other way round, I, mean, I thought it was an interesting um, approach, and I think he did a really good job with the character. Mm-hmm. Then we have a, a few quick tropes. So Colombo appeals to Carcini's ego by asking if he can return to learn more about wine. Yeah. And he then mentions his father, and he receives a call for him in the yes, office. he'd left the number. I, yeah. My understanding was he was getting the autopsy report here. Yes, the medical uh, examiner was providing the yeah the autopsy and what did the autopsy discover? The stomach was empty, he hadn't eaten for two days when he died. Mm-hmm. So he leaves and he apologises to the secretary for his odd the, his bizarre earlier behaviour. Yeah. Yeah. And then he does a sort of partial one more thing. He re-enters Carcini's office and he asks him if he really believes that the wind could blow down the roof. It's a strange exchange. A very, yes. It, it was odd. From both sides. It, I mean, mm. It's not clear what Colm was trying to do. And then Carcini comes up with this, oh, was it all the way up? Or was it three quarters mm. up? Or I think that he was, Colombo was just trying to unsettle him. Yeah. Storming think, back into the room when he thinks he's gone. To see what, you, mm. yeah, how what he's behaving. Yeah. And. Mm-hmm. That's, um, that would make the most sense, I think. Mm-hmm. We then head to Joan's apartment. Yes. And Joan's there with her <coughs> friend. Moustache man. Mm-hmm. Who has an awful lot of information to share. <laughs> he does. He well, Firstly, he confirms that Rick had a very healthy appetite. Appetite for what? We're not too sure. He's got a bizarrely intimate knowledge of everything to do with Rick. Mm-hmm. It's strange, but I suppose what we're trying, maybe learning from this, is that um, it's maybe some kind of communal group, or maybe Joan has just shared a lot of information with this guy. Mm-hmm. And Colombo states that the medical examiner, as we said, had found that he hadn't had anything to eat for two days. Yeah. And they can't offer an, an explanation as to why someone would not eat for two days and then go and attempt some scuba diving. Yeah, no. Very dangerous. Absolutely. Joan was played by... Joyce Jilson. And she's quite an interesting character. Is she? Doesn't have a massive uh, CV in terms of acting. She played Jill Smith in Peyton Place. And I had, I've actually seen a movie called Super Chick, which was made in 1973. It was a. Around about this time, yeah. Yes, a dreadful exploitation movie where she plays the eponymous Super Chick. Right. We won't get into that. You can look it up on IMDb if you're interested. Sure. It's ridiculous, but a little bit of fun. What is interesting about her is that she is an astrologist who for very many decades uh, had a nationally syndicated column of you know, over 200 newspapers. All right, okay. Um, she was Ronald Reagan's personal astrologist and she is claimed to have advised 
that George Bush Sr. be made his running mate in the 1980 campaign. That's fascinating. So she's like the American Russell Grant. <laughs> yes. A little bit thinner than, than Russell Grant. Uh, I think. Uh, he's lost a lot of weight, I'm sure. Was he on one of those... Uh, he's strictly. All right, not Fat Club or one of these I, things. I don't, I don't watch any of those, but okay. I'm aware that he was on that one. We go now to a... I like this scene. So we go to a, a wine shop. <laughs> and there seems to be some sort of expert there. No, he, before we go to the wine shop, he goes to talk to the guys from the wine club. You are right. I missed that scene out. Yeah. You eventually got me in. <laughs> so it's, yeah, it's the guys from the sort of wine society. It's their, their op- one of their offices, yeah? Yeah. We have Falcon and one of the other chaps, and they confirm they were with Carcini on the Sunday, and that he did not see, or they did not see Rick. But they also say that Carcini did leave the room for around about five minutes or so sure. to go and get a bottle of wine. And then, this is the most revealing moment in this scene. Critical. What happens? Well, they tell Columbo that Falcon was allowed to decant the claret. Mm-hmm. It's a jo- they tell him it's a job that needs a steady hand. Yes. So Columbo's obviously got an idea of what might have happened. Mm-hmm. And... Obviously, Adrian's just told Columbo that he never lets anybody else decant his, particularly his expensive wine. Columbo is now firmly on the trail, I think. Yeah, I think he knows who his guy is. Just a quick one. Falcon was played by Dana Elkar. Do you recognise him at all? No. Two things stand out for me. You know, he done a, he had a large CV, huge amount of sort of character act roles. Okay. But two things that stand out. He played... Thornton and MacGyver. He was just sort of head of the CIA type okay. agency. And he also played Agent Polk in The Sting, which is one of my favourite movies of all time. Oh, Top yeah. 10 of all time movies. Not seen that one. Mm. Oh, you should see it. Robert Redford, Paul Newman. Okay. Dan Elkar died in 2005 from, I think it was diabetes related illness. Okay. And he was blind through that. Th- the latter part of his, oh dear. Uh, his life. Sad story. Sad mm. end. We go now to the wine shop. Yes, we do. And there's an expert there. The, the shop owner, we yeah. presume. We heard from him at the very start of mm-hmm. this episode. So sum up the, this scene. Columbo essentially wants to know more about wine. Mm-hmm. Um, presumably it's going to assist him with his investigation. And he's been told that this guy's the, the preeminent expert in the local area. And he asks, can you share his knowledge? And the guy says, well, it took me 40 years to learn all this. And Columbo says, I've got an hour and a half. Um, And I've got, you know, what's the big question? How do you tell a good wine from a bad wine? And the answer is? The price. Not sure if that's strictly true. I'm sure there's a lot of wines out there which are not so cheap, but regarded as not being great. I'm sure that's true. You probably pay for a label on certain Mm -hmm. occasions or for a, a name. Yeah. Columbo seems to gain enough knowledge to, to help him and he goes to or back to Carcini's office. He does and he appears to demonstrate this newly found knowledge but mm-hmm. he's not really. He's used detective skills on this occasion to identify a wine. Yes, that that's correct. I was quite impressed however. Yeah, he's able to narrow it down through uh, a process of elimination essentially, mm-hmm. yeah. And Colombo mentions that he has only recently apparently discovered that wine can be an investment and he's astounded to hear that Carcini recently has paid £5,000 for a bottle. <laughs> yeah, $5,000. Th- yeah. Sorry. But, what yeah. Colombo says is he's heard bottles can go for as much as $100. <laughs> and I think that's deliberate. I think he must know about the $5,000 bottle and he's just kind of leading mm-hmm. Carcini because what he wants to do is see the seller. And it's an- another sort of money trope, isn't it? This is a regular occurrence where... Colombo is uh, really surprised by how much things can cost. He is. Colombo asks to see this expensive wine, as you say, and Carcini agrees. He's obviously very proud of them. Yeah, and happy I think to show them off. Carcini is playing a game here, but he hasn't identified a threat from Colombo, mm-hmm. or not at least not the right threat from Colombo yeah. at this point. So we get down to his private cellar, where the the wines are are stored. Yep, and he explains to Columbo that he's got to have his humidifier and his air conditioner on at all mm-hmm. times. And then almost immediately Columbo asks if he can use the phone and he leaves and goes to call his wife. 
Yeah, he's had an idea and he can't hold on to it. He has to go and <laughs> find out. Well, the I answer. think it's after he is given the information about the the temperature control being a yes. necessity. Yes, he realizes that one day last week it was really hot. It was so he goes it's and convenient. Asks, no. very, well, mm, mm-hmm, we will get to that as well. So he goes to he phones his wife and she can't remember what day that was. Yeah, she's not very helpful, but she does remember to get the shopping introduction. <laughs> And Columbo returns to the, um, the the wine cellar and says that he wouldn't like to get trapped in there. But Kersini says it's basically impossible as the, the door locks from the outside, so you can't accidentally lock yourself yeah, in so there. Columbo's hinting again that you trap someone in your cellar. Yeah. Hmm. Kersini's getting nervous as Columbo handles these very expensive bottles of wine. Yes, he swipes them back and puts them on the shelf. And Columbo brings up the fact that he found out that he allowed um, Falcon to decant the Yes, wine. yes, and, and Cassini's got a perfectly reasonable explanation. He was proud of being named man, and he only wanted to thank them, and he knew the guy was responsible as part of the wine club. I yeah. think that comes across okay. Well, no, I disagree with that, because I think that what happens is he lures him into this trap, Yeah. because he says at first, that must have been a cheap bottle that you had. And he says, on the contrary, it was one of my finest. Yeah. Because he's got this ego here. If he knew what was coming, he might have agreed that it wasn't an important wine. Yeah. But he, his ego will not allow that to, to think in that way. So he says, no, it's a very expensive bottle. And in that case, Columbo says, well, I'm really confused now. Why would you let him do this? Yeah. And he does, I think he, he does take a stumble. He has to, he takes a, a step back and then comes up with that explanation you mentioned. I don't yeah. think Columbo buys that, to be honest. Maybe not, maybe not. It's quite interesting that they talk about the years of some of these wines, and I'm like, oh, that's a long time ago. Mm. But then you have to put it, 73 was a long time ago yeah. as well, so it's, they're maybe not mm-hmm. quite the old, because you, you hear about these bottles of wine that are so old, you mm-hmm. couldn't possibly drink them, because they're almost certainly oxidised, yeah. or I think that's the right term. Yeah. So they're, they would be disgusting. Mm-hmm. This one must be somewhere in the bracket of being very valuable, but also still nice to drink. Mm-hmm. Now, I think in this scene, this is the first time that Carcini understands Columbo's suspicion. At the point where Columbo asks if Falcon had a steady hand. Yeah, yeah, he's getting the gist of it. Yeah. He's not an idiot. He's not. Columbo then again asks about this probability or possibility of being trapped in the uh, the cellar. And Carcini decides to prove that it's easy to get out of by by locking him in there. Yeah, this is a tricky one for you because Columbo wants him to do that. Of course he but does. But it's not like you could easily predict that that's what he would do. Mm. Yeah. We go back outside the winery after Columbo has easily escaped from this yes. wine cellar. Yeah, oh, I just had to turn that out very easy. Yeah, and Cursini seems very uneasy and he offers a hint and which Columbo takes that it's now time for him to, to leave. Yeah. But Cursini then wants to know when Rick's body will be released. And he's concerned that Columbo is involved in this incident, or this accident, cause, because yeah. he's a homicide detective. Yeah. And he himself suggests that perhaps other people think that there may be some sort of foul play involved. But Columbo reassures him that he's not a suspect. Because he wasn't even there. He's 3,000 miles away. And then Columbo... He whistles uh, this old man one more time and does a, a one more thing. Yes. What does he say? He says that the car was out for a week. It rained and then it was sunny, but there's no um, damage to the car at all. There's no evidence that that had even happened. And Carcini offers no explanation for this. No, finally he's realised he needs to shut up. Mm-hmm. And then Columbo has a silent conversation. Well, he yes, we don't hear what he's saying, but yeah. he's speaking to the security guard. Yeah, we find out soon enough what he was saying. Mm-hmm. So we go to Karen's house. Yeah, it's late at night. She's about to watch an Alan Ladd movie, I think. Yeah. And Columbo appears, but she seems quite reticent to help out at this point. Yeah, I think she's trying to work out what she should be saying. Mm -hmm. And she lies here. Yes. uh, How does she lie? Well, Columbo asks her about Rick coming on the Sunday. Did she see him arrive? Did she see him leave? And she says, yes, she did see him leave, Mm. which is not true. So, yeah, we understand then that she 
understands Columbo's suspicion. Yes. And Columbo tells her that he spoke to... Security guard. Yes. And he had said that Rick didn't leave. And Karen's cover for that is that the security guard's basically an alcoholic. He drinks the wine more than anything else yeah. and he's just there for a show, essentially. Yeah. And she seems to believe that Columbo has accepted that and the case is closed. I don't think she does believe that. Because she tells Garcini the next time she speaks to him that Columbo still suspects him. Mm. Yeah. But Columbo gives the impression, Columbo tries to give the impression that that solved the case for him or at least solved his concerns, settled his concerns about Garcini's involvement. And but yeah, because what he does next is he f- he asks he asks to use the uh, the phone and he phones Kirstini himself. Yes, from her he, phone. Yeah, he wants to apologise for acting suspiciously or suggesting that he might have something to do with it. Yep, the matter's now resolved. He wants to take them both out for dinner. Mm-hmm. And yes, so a few things here. <laughs> One is that apparently Karen doesn't get any say in the matter, so he arranges that this with. Carcini. Yes, the men are sorting this out. Mm-hmm. I mean, she's an employee, and this is obviously after hours, so she's under no obligation to attend a, a, a dinner with Colombo. No. Perhaps she'd other but plans. he's offering to buy her dinner. Yeah, but she may have had other plans. It's very sure. rude to assume. Well, I would say so. But the other interesting thing here is that, for the first time, Colombo mentions children. His own children, yes. yes. Mm-hmm. He said that he will, well, certainly a child at least, he said that he will try and bring the wife if they can arrange a babysitter. That's right, and in the end they can't. So do we, or do you believe in that this child and, uh, well, we assume the wife exists, but do you think that he had any intention of... No, he, he was never bringing his wife, so I don't, think we get, I don't think we can take this as fact. We can't rule it out, but mm-hmm. I don't think you can take it as evidence of anything, because he, would, he was just giving an excuse for why his wife wouldn't come. He then leaves and does a... This is brilliant. <laughs> quite a creepy one more thing. He traps her window. Yeah. And he asks... Oh, she, he discovers that she has worked for Christine for 12 years. Yeah. And he, he suggests that she quite likes him. Mm-hmm. See, this is why I said, I think initially when he said, ah, that's fine, that, that answer's uh, acceptable, she believed him. I think now... Now she's like... Well, she looks worried on. because she realises now that he hasn't, you know, hasn't let things lie. Yeah. And we go back to the winery the next evening. Yeah, and Corsini's taking Karen to the meal. Mm-hmm. There's a heavy-duty flirting going on. Yeah, it's quite uncomfortable, really. Well, he's it? flirting with her, Yeah, which well, is the strange thing. Yeah, she, she seems grateful that on for this occasion, and this occasion only, uh, she is al- allowed to call him Adrian. Yes, but he, yes, he says we'll dispense with the formal- formalities for tonight. And then the next thing is... Perhaps if tonight goes well, we can dispense with the formalities on an ongoing basis. Yeah. Now, this doesn't really fit with how he reacts later on. No. But I think there's a reason for that. We'll okay. come to that. And she tells him that she's not um, she's not happy with this meeting with Colombo. Yes. Because she thinks that he still suspects Carcini. Yes. And Carcini asks her what she thinks. Yeah, she lies again. We have a clip. I still wish we weren't having dinner with that man, though. Lieutenant Colombo? Why not? He still suspects you of killing your brother. Does he? He has no cause. After all, I was 3,000 miles away. I know, and so does he, but he still suspects you. Do you suspect me? Well... You've been quite a different person the last week. Even in New York, certain moments you seem very preoccupied. I asked you a specific question. Do you suspect me? I'd like an answer. No. Good. So I think this is the first point Carcini realises that Karen is actually suspicious herself. So he now knows that he's in a bit of a predicament here. Yeah, and I think that is what makes him back off from his mm-hmm. proactive romantic stance that he's taken previously. Karen herself is played by quite a, a quite a very accomplished actress. Okay. Um, it was Julie Harris. She died in 2013, aged 87. She was Oscar nominated for 
uh, a position in a leading role in 1953, but she's more famous or more successful as a theatre okay. actress. She had 11 Emmy nominations Oof. and three wins, 10 Tony nominations and five wins, and, and in fact she held the record for many decades in terms of Tony wins until Angela Lansbury from Murder, She Wrote, surpassed her, um, you know, after sort of 20, 20 or 30 years. She was one of the earliest members of the Lee Strasberg acting studio. We talked about that. Martin Landau Martin was Landau, also yeah. one of the first. And she starred alongside James Dean in East of Eden, one of his few movies. It's a well-known movie. Iconic. And in fact, if you look at the poster, her name is billed above James Dean. It's quite interesting, so, isn't yeah, it? So, yeah, she was a sort of bigger star at the time. We head off from there to the restaurant itself. Yeah, I, I really enjoy Colombo's arrival at the restaurant. It's there's, a, there's so many different parts of it that I enjoy. Yeah, it's a car trope, isn't it? We've well, got the car trope initially that Colombo turns up in his car, says it gets me over 100,000 miles, mm-hmm. and then the, the valley can't get it to start. Well, he says, yeah, if you treat it well, if you treat the car right, it'll treat you right, it'll look yeah. after you, and then it doesn't start. <laughs> But then when he goes into the restaurant, mm-hmm. he's absolutely stunned that they have separate red wine and white wine stewards. Yeah. But before that, the, the maitre d', he snootily sort of looks up and down Colombo. Yeah, dumps him in a bad seat. Beside the, the kitchen the kitchen door. Yeah. And then Carcini arrives. Yes, and he insists that they move to a better table. And the maitre d' is a grovelling, simpering snob, isn't he? Oh, contemptible. Played by Vito Scotti. Died in 1996, aged 78. And this is his first appearance, and he would go on to perform in another five episodes. That's quite a lot, yeah. He was in The Godfather, Get Shorty, amongst other... Now, that's interesting. So, he's an Italian fellow, Mm -hmm. and there's a big Italian theme to this. Mm -hmm. But the subtitles on Netflix continually refer to them as speaking in French. (laughs) Which is quite irritating. (laughs) Netflix subtitles aren't always the most accurate. They're certainly not canon. No. I'm pretty sure. The meal is nearly over. And there's a couple of things that annoy me about Columbo in this scene. Well, he's impressed his fellow dinner guests with his choices of wine up to this point. Sure, but he, twice he mentions the cost of the, the meal. Now, when you invite someone out... It's very rude. Extraordinarily rude. He, you know, he's sort of huffing and puffing about, oh, jeez, this is going to cost... Uh, some amount, and you're making your, your guests feel very uncomfortable. Yeah, yeah. Just like, Almost like they have to offer to pay their yeah, share, which he does. But you know, Colombo refuses. But it's not a it's a horrible thing to do. Yeah. Anyway, and, and yeah, the other thing which he does is that he snaps his he snaps his finger for the waiter. Yeah. Now, I don't know if this was ever. I mean, it's a caricature. It's a stereotype of the. Uncouth. Diner. Yeah. It's just something you don't do. You should never snap your fingers. That's true. Maybe, but then we know that this particular waiter in Colombo have had a conversation prior to Carcini's yeah, arrival. We do, we do know that, but still, my question here was, was that ever acceptable in the 70s to snap your, your, your fingers at a waiter? I think it's just rude, and I think it would be seen as a sign of a rude guest. Mm-hmm. Colombo asks for a particular type of port. Dessert wine. Yes, a very exclusive and rare type. Carcini is very doubtful they will have this, and he even mentions that it would be very expensive if they do. Yeah. And he's surprised when the waiter brings a bottle to the table. And they had one left. He's hugely excited, isn't he? Yeah. He's really uh, looking forward to this. He thinks it's going to make the meal, and he implores Karen not to smoke. Yeah, to ruin the flavour. Mm-hmm. And what happens? Colombo tastes it, he's quite happy, Karen has some, she loves it, and then Carcini is given some. And we have a clip here of his reaction. This is dreadful. Sure, you? This is dreadful. Don't you realise that a great wine is like a great work of art? It has to be nurtured, it has to be taken care of. You have subjected this port to a temperature in excess of 150 degrees. 
Such disdain cannot and must not be tolerated. I advise you not to pay for the check. But, sir, I think that... Uh... This wine has been oxidized by overheating. Oh, no. Where did you keep it? On top of the stove? I assure you, monsieur. Don't you know any delicate wine spoils by being subjected to a rapid change in temperature? Serving this iodine is an insult. Monsieur Corsini, is there something wrong? Is there something wrong? Everything is wrong. An exciting meal has been ruined by the presence of this liquid filth. Monsieur Corsini, it is not our intention. Oh, dear. <laughs> I love that. He certainly is a passionate man. Very. He suggests that Colombo doesn't pay the, the bill, the cheque. Yes. Now, was that just for the wine? Or for the, no, whole, for the meal? whole meal? It's been ruined. I don't think you can... And he doesn't pay the cheque for no, the whole meal. I don't think you can get away with that. You know, if your wine is not up to scratch, you yeah. knock that off the bill. You don't get away with it. <laughs> but especially as Colombo's set this up with the waiter. <laughs> the restaurant's getting ripped off. Um, yeah, it's quite a, an overreaction, yeah. but I think that hints at his short views. Yeah, and I think the actor must have had a lot of fun playing this mm-hmm. character. We go to the outside of the restaurant, and Christine apologises for losing his temper, and he confirms to Colombo that the reason the port was spoiled was because that it was exposed to a high, a, temperature. A high temperature. And then Colombo, this is quite, I like the way this was worked. Colombo takes the opportunity. To mention that he needs to get his fridge fixed. Because of the high temperatures the previous well, week. Yes. And Just drops it in there. The Okay, so Karen and Carcini were not aware that when they were in New York there was, was a heat, heat wave. wave. Yep. And rain. And but, yeah. well that's I've got yeah, that's the thing here. Really this Okay, well we're discussing it just now, so There was rain followed by a heat wave. You but, could understand it more the other way around. Yeah. This whole the whole clue Supposed proof yep. relies on this heat wave. That's one day when the, the wine was spoiled. And really, I, I don't know too much about the LA climate or the LA temperature, but is it likely that within the space of a week you get this this rain, which it seems unlikely in LA most of the time, but you get this rain and then a heat wave within a, a space of a few yeah. days? Maybe some of our LA listeners will be able to tell us, but I mean, like I say, I can understand if you've got a heat wave and then it breaks and it rains. Mm-hmm. The other way around seems to me. I don't know. I guess it's fiction and we can let it go, but... Carcini is shocked at the revelation anyway because he understands what that means. Yeah. And then Columbo also reveals Karen's lie. Yes, well, he says he says his goodbyes and he says that, or he pretends that they will not be meeting again. Yes, and he explains why. He tells Carcini exactly what Karen said and that perturbs Carcini. Well, what, tell me what the lie was. Well, when she we mentioned it earlier when she said that she saw Rick leave. Mm-hmm. And Columbo says that if he hadn't had that information, he would still be investigating, but now he's quite content. And we're in Carcini's car as he's driving Karen home. Yes, and he explains that this was a stupid thing to do because Columbo had no proof. Mm -hmm. He's very unhappy and unsettled by the fact that Karen has managed to... She's now got something over him. It's not even that he thinks it'll help Columbo, it's more the fact that he thinks it's going to give her some kind of potential to blackmail yeah it's not just it's not just a financial blackmailing she admits her feelings uh, to him but he's not happy at all is he oh he's, he's greatly unhappy and i thought oh she's in for here and i thought oh she's in for mm-hmm. it here because it's the typical thing you try and blackmail a killer in colombo you're for it but then i thought oh well there's only five minutes of the episode yeah. left it's maybe pushing yeah. it a bit close yeah if you are a if you, especially if you're a secretary. Oh yeah, she's she's Columbo. asking for it and she's lucky to get away with it. And it, certainly in the Columbo universe. Yeah, although I think we might find later on that she ends mm. up in prison herself. Mm. So he drops her off and she says that she does believe that he killed Rick or was certainly involved in, in his yeah. death, but that nobody would blame him. He doesn't admit to anything, but we can tell he is extremely unhappy. He's not the type of person who likes anyone having yeah. anything over him. There's kind of an awareness. I think they both realise at this point what the situation is. And well, Karen is not inclined to go to the police about this. No, but she suggests that they take a vacation together. But he's having none of that. Yeah, she's trying to be subtle at first, but then she she just comes flat out with it. But she says that, oh, I, I get the feeling you're trying to turn me back into an employee. And then he very coldly says that... You're never anything more than an yeah. employee. And this stirs her. And she says that you know, that's not the case anymore. 
They are now partners. Yes. Uh, perhaps professional and personal? Yeah, I think certainly personal, probably professional. Okay. And we have a, a nice clip here of how that, how that works. Yeah. You're trying to get rid of me. Karen, it's... It's very late, and I have a number of things to do. You're trying to turn me back into an employee. You were never anything but an employee. Not anymore, Adrian. Not anymore. I'm your partner now. And I intend getting a great deal more from you than 700 a month and two weeks paid vacation. I gave you 12 years of my life. Now it's your turn to give me something. You can't force me into loving you, Karen. Maybe not. But you don't have to love me to marry me. I don't like her chances, to be honest. No, I think she's more likely to end up um, at the bottom of the sea in scuba gear than <laughs> down the aisle. So, Carcini leaves. And he says he'll discuss it the next day. Yeah. Yeah. And we go quickly We quickly go to his uh, private cellar again, and we yep. see him emptying his uh, wine rack. Spoiled wine, yep. Yep, and he smashes a bottle in, in disgust and rage on the floor. He does. And then we're back off to the cliffside where the, the Ferrari was uh, previously found. That's it, and he's clearing out this cell, he's chucking all the bottles away into the sea. Mm -hmm. And then there's a moment which reminded me of both Death Lends a Hand and Blueprint for Mm -hmm. Murder, where Columbo has anticipated the killer's behaviour. I don't understand that one. It was more apparent and it was more believable why Columbo would know what the the killer was going to do. But in this case... There was no reason for him to go back to that same point. No, and so Columbo was following him or spying on him. Perhaps. What was more likely that Cassini would have done nothing immediately with the wine or if he wanted to destroy it he could simply have sort of tipped it down the, the drain Yeah, which would have been the, the obvious thing to do. So that didn't really Didn't ring true. No I, I don't disagree too strongly but I don't think it's a major issue mm-hmm. But Colombo's waiting for him anyway and he this is one of the times where the the, the, the killer basically col- uh, collapses and admits their guilt immediately. Well, almost immediately. Mm. Colombo explains that when he was locked in the cellar, he stole a bottle of port. You know, his big trench coat pockets coming in handy. Yeah. And <laughs> well, it's, unless it's full of uh, salt shakers and pepper shakers. Well, that's it. It would clang around a wee bit, wouldn't it? Uh, and also that he took it to the restaurant, and so that was one of Carcini's yeah. bottles that they'd been drinking. Because yeah, what he confirms again is, or what he makes clear is that on the, the Thursday... The twentieth, he says that they did have this heat wave. Yeah. So that you know any wine stored in conditions which were not controlled would have been ruined. Yes. And as you say, he had taken along a bottle of port that Carcini owned, and that was yeah. what was served up. And and Carcini appreciates the fact that the irony. It's his own expertise that's nailed him here. Yes. Because very few folk would have recognised the problem with mm-hmm. the with the wine, and. That's it's, you know he, he finds it almost amusing. I yeah, think. he was actually disappointed. He asked if the heat wave was a record, and Colombo says no, it wasn't. <laughs> yeah, he's disappointed at that. Yeah. yeah, and then Colombo asks if he will get a confession from him. He says, "Oh yes, I will." Yeah, and he, he gives a he goes into this rant about Karen about how she guessed the truth. She was turning the thumb screws. She's an Iron Maiden, and essentially freedom would be relative. Prison's probably not that much worse than having to be married to her. Yeah, so a little point here, yeah, he said, well, that's what he said, that uh, freedom is purely relative. Yeah. But he says that he'd rather have life in prison than marriage. Yeah. Now, if you remember back to Suitable for Framing, the implication was that uh, Dale Kingston would be facing the, the death penalty. Yeah. So unless there's been a change in the Well, this wasn't a first-degree murder, so Dale Kingston had planned his murder in advance mm. and would face the death penalty. This was a heat-of-the-moment one, more likely to be a Second degree murder charge, so yeah. maybe less likely to be death penalty. Fair enough. Um, okay. We come to a, an, another moment here, though, where Columbo, I think, breaks protocol. Mm-hmm. Yes, <laughs> because he, he he drives him back in the the, the, the car, and he brought a, a lovely uh, dessert wine for him to enjoy. Yeah, yeah. It's a strange one because Columbo, I think, here is showing respect for the killer. I don't think he's really earned from Columbo mm-hmm. during the episode. He likes and respects him. Well, I'll, I'll tell you why. That's you know, sort of final bit of trivia I, I have really is that 
This is Peter Falk's favourite Colombo episode. Right. And he himself says that this is the first time that Colombo did respect and did like the killer. Right. And the reason was that he respected his obsession for perfection, which okay. Colombo understood because he had the same right, so that, looking life. Right, so that explains it's not anything to do with his conduct. No. Okay. Just that he was a man who yeah, was focused and did like things to be just right. Okay. Do you think Karen might be in trouble with the law? Notwithstanding the fact that she might turn oh, she was state's evidence. Withholding evidence? Yeah. Oh, certainly. With it, yeah. I don't think there's any doubt about Not that. Not to mention the blackmail. Yeah. Yeah, but I suspect perhaps as a practical matter. Well, he's confessed now, so they don't need her evidence. So she might be in trouble. Yeah, so that's the, I mean, that's the end of this episode. Yeah, we got an appropriate closing shot that mimics the opening shot. Mm-hmm. Which I thought was quite nice. In summary... What did you think of any old Portmore storm? Before you do answer, you are aware it's a it's a classic Colombo episode, regarded very highly by yeah Colombo fans. I think most people would have this in their certainly their top ten Colombo episodes. Yeah, no, I hated every minute of it. It was <laughs> dire. No, I I thought it was probably the best since, and possibly better than the very first episode that I watched. Mm-hmm. And we noted early on that there was some similarities in the setup to Murder by the Book. Yeah. And I think that this episode with the longer format, which worked nicely this time, was a great episode and a great uh, Colombo episode, if that makes sense. Sure. I liked the process. I liked the investigation. I liked the conclusion. I thought it was very nicely done and I really enjoyed it from that, beginning to end. Excellent. I'm glad you enjoyed that. As I mentioned, it was an episode which was 96 minutes, but it could it, it was able to handle that. It wasn't, yeah, it wasn't padded. It no. wasn't dragged out. There was nothing that you thought, well, what were they doing mm-hmm. here? The 7th of October, 1973. That was when it was first broadcast. The director was Leo Penn. He died in 1998, aged 77. This was the first of three Colombo episodes he directed. He also directed many, many excellent TV shows and some of my personal favourites. Okay. So we have Matlock for 27 episodes, <laughs> Diagnosis Murder, Jake and the Fat Man, Magnum, Heart to Heart, Kojak, Starsky and Hutch, Barnaby Jones, Star Trek, there you go. Bonanza, Hawaii Five O, and one episode of Mrs. Colombo. Oh, he's ruined it. Right at the <laughs> end there, much. he's absolutely ruined it. The teleplay was... Written by Stanley Ralph Ross. Died in 2000, aged 64. Most famous for direct uh, for writing 60 episodes of Wonder Woman, 2 Colombo episodes and 27 episodes of Batman. Uh, we've had that connection before, I think. Mm-hmm. Larry Cohen came up with the story. He was born in 1941. Fairly recently, he w- was a writer, uh, or he wrote... Phone Booth, the Colin Farrell movie. Okay. Uh, Maniac Cop, which is one of my personal favourite trilogies from the the 80s. Absolute garbage, but I have a soft spot. Uh, He also wrote three Columbo episodes. So that's us. We are back next week. Back next week with a candidate for crime. An even longer episode. Is it? I believe so. 98 minutes, I believe, next week. I think that one also holds up well. Okay, well, I hope so. I'm looking forward to watching it after this week, which was great. Anything you want to say before we wrap up? No, no, I'm quite happy. Um, I hope everybody remembers to join the conversation at columbopodcast.com. Leave us ratings and reviews on iTunes. Like we keep saying, it makes a big difference. Talk to us on Twitter at Columbo Podcast. And we'll see you all next week. And goodbye. Cheerio.